increasing lifespan, we've gotten pretty good at with modern medical technology. And basically we can extend people's lives and have them live for a lot longer. But how long can we have people live healthfully? How long can we have people live without being burdened with chronic disease and living independently and feeling good? I'm Esther Garfin, the founder of Alternative Food Network, your source for trustworthy content about how the food you eat can benefit your health. You're listening to the Plant-Based Diet Podcast, where we talk about all things plant-based to help you with your journey wherever you're at. It's the what, why, and how to eat plant-based. Today's chat is about longevity with the plant-forward nutritionist herself, Hannah Van Ark. In this episode, we're going to take a closer look at the role of a plant-based diet in promoting longevity and the science behind it. Since this episode is coming out during the month of February, we also have a Valentine's treat from Hannah, who will be telling us how to make some black bean chocolate brownies with a raspberry compote. Now, another quick mention about Alternative Food Network's other podcast series, Doctors Plus Premium, which is on Apple Podcasts. It's a paid subscription, though reasonably priced, I might add, for fantastic food as medicine information. We'd love your support so we can keep on doing what we love to do, which is to help and inform all of you. Not to mention that by subscribing, you'll get access to phenomenal doctors' conversations about nutrition and the concept of food as medicine, plus new recipes. It's content you can trust, hosted by culinary medicine physician, Dr. Sabrina Falke. For more information and to subscribe to the Doctors Plus Premium episodes, you can access Apple Podcasts in the podcast app on your iPhone or on your Mac. Now, a bit more about our guest today, Hannah Van Ark, is a registered dietitian dedicated to helping people thrive by eating more plants. Her work in longevity and heart health nutrition research starting in 2012 inspired her to adopt a plant-forward lifestyle which transformed her own health and grew into a passion for helping others do the same. Hannah received her bachelor's degree in integrative physiology and a certificate in neuroscience from the University of Colorado at Boulder and her master's degree in human nutrition science from Colorado State University. She worked as a student and professionally in clinical and translational research, focusing on anti-aging and improving heart health through nutrition interventions. She completed her dietetic internship at Children's Hospital Colorado and worked in acute care as a clinical dietitian before branching off to start her own private practice in 2021. Now she coaches clients from around the world through her virtual programs as the Plant Forward Nutritionist. Welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you so much, Esther. I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm so happy we're doing this. And, and you know, this episode is coming out in February, which, uh, I mean, we're recording via video. So I'm wearing this sh- sweater full of hearts. I love it. <laughs> I normally don't dress like this when I do podcasts, but... <laughs> Perfect for figured, Valentine's Day. <laughs> right. I figured you'd get in the spirit since you're also going to be making a dessert later on um, that's, uh, that's right. both nutritious and libido boosting, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I'm super excited to share that with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, also, I wanted to mention, I really love your Instagram account. I oh, think your you. videos are great. So I just wanted to give you a little shout out there. Thank um, you. For those who are curious about that, what, what is the uh, handle on that? Yeah, so I am plant.forward.nutritionist on Instagram, and that's honestly where I spend most of my time. I love finding and connecting with clients there and just posting videos and kind of just informative content. So definitely give me a follow there if you're interested. Yeah, they're, they're great videos. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, let's talk a little bit about your background, because, uh, I mean, I mentioned a lot of your education uh, in the intro to this episode, but I, I thought it would be interesting to find out a little bit more about your work in the lab when you were working on nutrition and longevity research. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for the kind introduction. And again, so happy to be here. Um, Yeah, so I'm a registered dietitian now, but I actually didn't start out in my health kind of focused career as a nutritionist or a dietitian. I was initially very interested in physiology and brain science and things like that. So my undergraduate degrees, I um, actually was involved in research really early on as an undergraduate. And then after I even graduated from 
my undergraduate degree, I worked there professionally for a few years as well. And we essentially worked in a laboratory that focused on longevity research. And so we looked into how we can improve lifespan and how we can essentially catch people at the midlife point and do some sort of intervention. And a lot of our nu- interventions were nutrition interventions, which is what started to get me interested in nutrition. And then see if we can improve their heart health to improve their long-term health as well. So I worked in um, a laboratory to do that for about four years, and then another laboratory that did that for a little while too. And the two main things that I studied were actually to plant compounds. So this is what started to get me very interested in more of a plant-based diet and a plant-forward lifestyle. And those were beets, so red beets, and also turmeric. And so turmeric is a spice that's an anti-inflammatory spice. And those were the two main things that I studied. And we would basically give these components to people and see if we can improve their heart health or their memory or their cognitive function um, through a variety of tests that we did. So that's a little bit about my research background and kind of where I started. But it was a time in my life where I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I was thinking med school, maybe. I was thinking I wasn't quite sure. I knew I wanted to do something to help people improve their health. So when we started to focus so much on nutrition, that's when I was like, this could be something that I could really, you know, dig into and start to focus on helping people improve their nutrition for longevity. And that's what inspired me to actually become a dietitian and move through school in that way. And then that's what I do now. Um, And then, of course, being in that world, I was always surrounded by the nutrition research. It was just part of my job to be up to date on longevity nutrition research. So I'd be reading things for six years all about how, you know, a plant-based diet can help to improve long-term health. And so that's what inspired me to adopt a predominantly plant-based diet. And that's what I teach my clients to do now as well. And since since you've been in the lab, I mean, you've mm-hmm. had a private practice for a bit. Uh, what are the latest studies on uh, plant-based diet, plant-based eating for longevity and, and healthy aging? Yeah, so that's a great question. And there's so many studies and so many different types of studies too. This is something that I think as researchers we might take for granted, but there's things called observational studies where you can look at long populations over a long period of time, for example, or clinical trials where you actually try to change something in the moment, or even test tube studies where you're exploring like the pathways that actually help with longevity. So a lot of research and things are coming out every single year. Um, what I will say is what we know about the majority of research is that it, pl- it points to a predominantly plant-based diet, but not necessarily an entirely plant-based diet. So we say like 90% or more plant-based or calories coming from plants tends to produce the the longest lived healthiest people. And also the the focus of longevity research isn't necessarily increasing lifespan, it's increasing something called health span. And I'm not sure if you've heard of this or your audience may have heard of this before, but increasing lifespan, we've gotten pretty good at with modern medical technology and basically we can extend people's lives and have them live for a lot longer. But how long can we have people live healthfully? How long can we have people live without being burdened with chronic disease and living independently and feeling good? That's what health span is. And so when we're looking at longevity research, typically as researchers, we focus on expanding health span and not just lifespan so that we can have most of our years of our lives be good and independent and disease free. Um, And so in terms of the latest research that has been coming out, I would say that there's, there were some recent, um, more recent, just larger sort of looking at the centenarian studies. I don't know. Have you heard about the blue zones and heard of that concept before? So this is one for for anyone in the audience who hasn't, maybe you could explain that. Yeah, and so this came out maybe about 10, and they've been doing research since, you know, um, so 10 years ago, and they've been continuing to do research on these populations since. But these studies are really important because they're basically studying people who have lived to the age of 100, and specifically, they're studying populations where there's a higher rate or a higher percentage of people living to over the age of 100 than is typical for humans. And so these zones are called the blue zones. They're longevity hotspots essentially throughout the world. And 
There's a few of them. Um, there's one in Costa Rica called Nicoya Peninsula. There's one in Greece called Icaria. There's Sardinia, Italy. There's Okinawa, Japan. And then there's also Loma Linda, California. And that's a little bit of one that people are like, what's the blue zone doing in the United States considering our standard American diet isn't exactly longevity promoting? Um, so I always like to mention that's the main hub of the Seventh-day Adventist church in those um, in individuals tend to practice a religion that focuses on taking care of the body really well. So vegetarian and vegan lifestyles are really common there. So even in the United States, we have a very predominantly plant-based community that is living longer. So these studies are really interesting. This is some of the most interesting observational data that we have. Um, in terms of knowing what works for longevity. And in these zones, they're 90% plant-based, they're limiting red meat, they're limiting a lot of animal products in general. Um, they tend to eat a lot of beans and grains and nuts and seeds and all sorts of leafy green vegetables and fruits. Um, another really interesting, more recent study that I would say that came out, this is probably in 2014 or 15, but we now know that a moderate to low protein diet is actually better for longevity than a high protein diet. And I don't know if you'd heard about that before. Plant-based diets tend to be a little lower in protein just on average than diets that are really heavily based in animal products, I would say. And we know that if you're eating a ton of protein, sometimes that stimulates certain pathways in the body that also stimulate premature aging. So that would be things like insulin life growth factor one or human growth hormone. There's these pathways in the body that build, build up and help you build muscle and all of this stuff, but they also may prematurely age people. And so we know that by cutting back on protein just a little bit, and of course we still need adequate protein, like it's really important to get enough protein on any diet or any lifestyle, but a moderate amount seems to be preferable from a longevity standpoint to a really high protein diet. So Walter Longo is a researcher who's pretty big in the space and he came out with that work, you know, not too long ago. So that was a very interesting study as well. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that we don't need as much protein as we might think we do. And certainly what you're saying flies in the face of a little bit of what of that clickbait that's out there, you know, a lot, a lot of totally. what you see on social media, right? And protein, you need this much protein and all that stuff. So it's interesting what you just said. Yeah. And I think that that's especially common in like the weight loss communities and things like that. When we're looking to lose weight sustainably or find our body's best weight, oftentimes a really high protein diet is pushed. And it's not that you, you we do need protein, like we need protein to maintain lean muscle as we lose weight and things like that. But really going too heavy on the protein can have some long-term unintended consequences. And I like to be sure that people are aware of that just based on this most recent research. You need adequate protein. You don't need too much protein is what I like to say. And so just focusing on eating whole foods and eating, you know, foods in quantities that's sufficient for you, that that'll typically get you enough protein if you're including some protein rich foods, even if they're plant foods. So like beans and, you know, even whole grains have quite a bit of protein and things like that. Yeah, you know what I've recently discovered that gives me a lot of energy, and I don't know if it's because of the protein or whatever, but lentils. Yes. I love lentils now. <laughs> lentils are amazing, and they have, they're such a great and easy and inexpensive protein, too. I mean, like, you can get so many lentils, and they're just so filling. They've got, you know, a great amount of protein. They've also got something called soluble fiber. And there's two types of fiber that are found in plants. There's like the scratchy fiber that you get in like wheat bran, and then there's soluble fiber. And this is in the insides of grains and beans typically. And that soluble fiber is like power fuel for healthy gut bacteria. So it's really important to be eating foods rich in soluble fiber, which include lentils. They include beans, whole grains, and fruits and things like that. And that'll really... Um, make your gut health supercharged. And that can, of course, translate into just feeling overall better and energized, you know, as a person. Okay, great. 
Yay lentils. <laughs> yeah, le- yay lentils for sure. Eat more beans. <laughs> yeah. Beans are my favorite food. <laughs> uh, are, really? <laughs> Absolutely. I think beans are so underrated. I think if everybody ate more beans, and that's what they show in the longevity hotspots, by the way, they all rely heavily on beans. So they're a great source of protein, they're a great source of fiber, and a great slow, healthy source of carbohydrates as well. I'll ask you, if if someone's listening and they, mm-hmm. they haven't historically eaten a lot of beans, yeah. is there a way to introduce more beans into the diet so that you don't get some of the consequences of eating beans? Absolutely. <laughs> and what people. you're referring to, I'm sure, because I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who are like, I've had a lot of clients, for example, come to me, want to eat more plant-based, but really have trouble with the digestive distress that can come along with, you know, incorporating more fiber-rich foods and especially beans. And typically what this means is there's a mis- there, there's basically a mismatch between the bacteria in your gut that you need to digest the beans and what's there right now. And so basically when you're eating beans, your gut isn't prepared for it. It's producing a lot of that gas and bloating. So the solution is not never to eat beans. The solution is to eat beans low and slow in a very sort of low quantity so that you eventually grow that garden of gut bacteria that's needed to digest them comfortably, if that makes sense. Um, So what I recommend is typically starting, like I said, low and slow. You do not need to eat a lot of beans at once to start getting the benefits of growing those healthy gut bacteria. You can just go ahead and start with, I recommend two tablespoons per day, but do it every day. And then from there, maybe a few weeks later, you can graduate yourself to three or four tablespoons a day. But doing it consistently and doing it in small quantities will start to get your gut used to it. It'll start to develop the right bacteria to digest those things comfortably. And before you know it, most people do feel totally fine with beans in terms of just being able to eat them regularly, which is great. Okay, that's a great tip. (laughs) Uh, So, okay, so I did the roadblock of beans. What what other types of roadblocks to your clients' experience when it comes to, you know, they want to incorporate more plant-based foods into their diet, but? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say they want to incorporate more plant-based foods into their diet, but they're really overwhelmed and confused by all of the messages out there that might say otherwise. So the amount of information that we have in our day and age is just astounding, especially when it comes to nutrition information. So a lot of times people come to me and they just feel very confused about what to believe because you've got the keto diet and you have the carnivore diet and you've got you know the South Beach diet and calorie counting and macro tracking and Everybody sounds like they have the solution, so it's really hard to know who to believe. So a lot of times it's just doubt about whether or not a plant-based diet is truly going to help their health and help them towards their goals. And so that's one of the things that I usually see with some clients. Um, The other thing is basically the all or nothing mentality. And what I mean by that is that when people are interested in going plant-based, sometimes they're really interested in going 100% plant-based, which is what we would call vegan. And that's great. There's so many amazing reasons to you know, be 100% plant-based. It's got so many environmental benefits, ethical benefits, health benefits, all of this stuff. So if you want to be 100% plant-based, it's a great goal. I personally am not 100% plant-based. I do incorporate all foods into my personal diet, but I am predominantly over 90% plant-based. But I think that what people think when they think plant-based is that you have to be vegan. I don't know if you've heard this a lot and that maybe you've gotten there. And we did an episode, actually. Uh, We took some of our guests last year and did these little little clips with them explaining the difference between vegan and plant-based so that it was clear that they're not one and the same. Exactly. I'm so glad that you did that and that we're bringing more awareness to that because I think this is a barrier for some people who want to explore plant-based but feel like they can't do it perfectly enough, you know, feel like they can't do it well enough. And that's what I sort of would call the all or nothing mentality. It's like I have to do it all or I can't do it any, any of it, you know. And so I think that that holds people back in a lot of ways, but especially when trying more plant-based foods. I think that even just starting to incorporate more plant-based foods into your lifestyle – starts to move you towards plant-based and it doesn't have to be a complete overnight shift. So that's another issue I would say that I I see in the clients that come to me as well. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm going to ask you another one. We are seemingly in recessionary times. So uh, what about, do do you find that your clients are are weary of, of 
going to the supermarket and buying plant foods because they think it's expensive. Yes. And I think that this is a pretty big misconception about healthy eating in in general, but especially healthy eating on a plant-based diet because plant foods are very inexpensive compared to animal products. And I think that the more people shift their especially protein sources to more plant-based sources of protein, when they're trying when you're we're trying to get the healthiest form of protein, oftentimes we're going to gravitate towards when we do eat meat, like the grass-fed steak, for example. That's going to run you about 25 bucks a pound, you know, on a good day, you know, depending on where you're getting it from. Whereas a package of tofu, which is three servings of protein for, you know, somebody my size, that's only $2.99 for organic tofu. So we're talking a huge difference in terms of cost. Dried beans or even canned beans are extremely inexpensive and a very versatile and easy source of protein to keep on hand, especially canned beans. You can just rinse them and dump them onto a salad like there's no easier way, you know, but if you want to even cut costs more, you can buy them dried and cook them yourself and it cuts the cost in half even from canned beans. So I would say it's it's a common misconception that eating more healthy foods is going to necessarily increase your grocery bill. There are certain foods, especially if you prioritize like organic foods, for example, um, in the fresh food section, like the fruits and vegetables that are going to be just a little bit more expensive. But I think that the number one way that we also can cut back on our food costs is just by being prepared, meal planning, using the food we have, and not eating out quite as much. And I think a lot of us, especially during the pandemic, might have gotten into the habit of doing more takeout. Um, and that is, if you truly look at the at the expense of eating out and bringing in takeout compared to preparing a healthy food with quality ingredients from your own home, I think you'd see that um, it's not as expensive to cook healthfully as, as we might think. Yeah. Yeah. I know one, one thing that I would wonder, and I, I got this answered on another episode we did, but I'm curious if you do it. If you're opening a can of beans or lentils or something like that, but you just don't need it all, do you ever freeze them, the leftover? You absolutely can freeze them for sure. Usually what we do is we have these little um, silicone covers that are like reusable can covers. And so we'll just pop one of those on the can and leave it in the fridge and we'll use it probably within three to five days. And so we typically do go through beans quite a bit, but if we don't use all of them, easy to store them in the fridge, just in the can with a reusable boop silicone cover, super easy. And if you don't feel like you're going to get to it, you know, that soon, because I really do recommend about three to five days with beans. You don't want to leave them in the fridge for longer no, than that. No. Um, freeze them, just pop them yeah. in the freezer, easy as can be. And then when you feel like you might want them the next day, just put them on the top shelf of the fridge and defrost them for the next day. It can be okay. really easy to do that too. Great. Yeah. And uh, you were mentioning meal planning before, yes, uh-huh. and you uh, are offering our audience a free meal planning guide. So we're going to yes. put that, uh, it's on your website, and we're going to mm-hmm. put a link to that in our episode notes. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I think that meal planning is kind of the disconnect sometimes when it comes to healthy eating. And meal planning, for the record, does not have to be you prepare everything in advance and you're eating the same food over and over again. My definition of meal planning is simply ensuring that you have access to nourishing foods on hand that you need to make your meals and snacks. And that's what we need to sort of make sure that we do, whether that's through grocery shopping, whether even whether that's through having a plan for healthy takeout or something like that, all of that can be a part of the meal plan. So what I've created is a free resource called Creating Your First Plant Forward Meal Plan, and it teaches you my step-by-step process and walks you exactly through what I do every week just to be sure that I'm preparing for my week and having those nourishing foods on hand, but also making sure that what I'm eating is 90% plants, because that can be tough to do sometimes. If we're striving for this predominantly plant-based diet, how can we tell if we're eating 90% plants, if we're even getting close? In this free guide, I have a really easy way to estimate this, and that's kind of the method that I teach. And so I find that a lot of my followers have found this really, really helpful. And then it also comes with some you know, templates and handouts and worksheets to kind of get you through, as well as a sample meal plan with some recipes as well. That is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we can share that resource with our audience. Yeah, um, and I'm excited too. Yeah, I hope that you guys find it helpful. And it's something that my audience is really, really, and I just want, I truly just want people to really start thinking that it's not as hard as 
it needs to be to eat more plants, you know? I want to get more plants onto more plates, and so I'm excited that um, people have been responding well to that, and I hope that it's helpful for you guys, too. (laughs) Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, Now, uh, next, you're going to be switching uh, rooms, and you're actually going to be going into a kitchen to bake some uh, black bean brownies uh, right. in honor I'm of excited. Valentine's Day. <laughs> but before you do that, mm-hmm. can you tell us uh, how our audience can get in touch with you? What's the best place to find you? Yeah, absolutely. So the best place to find me is probably Instagram. That's where I am the most uh, most often. And so that's plant.forward.nutritionist on Instagram. And you can also go to my website. That's www.theplantforwardnutritionist.com. And I have all my stuff there and some information about my offerings and coaching and courses and things like that too. Okay. And now here is Hannah in the kitchen or from her kitchen. (laughs) <laughs> and she's going to walk you through a Valentine's dessert. Yes, I'm so excited. I tried these out this weekend and they're so good. So they're actually fudgy black bean brownies with a raspberry pomegranate compote on top. And they're so delicious. They're bite-sized. They're really convenient. And they're full of healthy ingredients that are both longevity promoting, like we were just talking about, and also a little bit of libido boosting ingredients as well, all perfect for Valentine's Day. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And basically, I've got all my ingredients out here. Um, Got to get my beans from the fridge. So I'm going to pull out my beans. Here we go. So While you're doing funny. that, can, can yeah. I ask you, I yeah. mean, I would imagine that upon first hearing this, someone might go, ooh, black beans <laughs> and a brownie. I have to tell you a story. Um, so I was totally anti-black bean brownies because I thought that they sounded so weird. And I'm like, we don't need to like healthify absolutely every dessert. Are they even going <laughs> right. to taste good? And I'm famous on my Instagram for saying, I don't like black bean brownies. And I tried this recipe a a while ago and I loved it. And I think that what maybe the problem was for the black bean brownies I'd tried before was that they maybe didn't have quite enough sweetener. You do need some sweetener to make them taste good, but I kid you not, they are so fudgy. They are so moist and like very dense. They taste delicious. And so I know that it's, you might think that they're going to just taste like black beans, but they don't. They taste like brownies. My husband loves brownies and he has been eating these. So I've got, you know, some taken out of the fridge already and tell, uh, believe me, they are really, really good. So okay, awesome. <laughs> it's a good question though. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually combine most of these ingredients here in the food processor. So before I get started, I wanted to make some flax eggs. Now, if you've ever heard of flax eggs before, basically it's an egg replacement that we can use that's a plant-based substitute. And it's for vegan meals. You just take two tablespoons of flax seeds and then you combine that with six tablespoons of water. So the ratio for flax seeds to water is about three to one for water to flax seeds. So then what you wanna do is you wanna mix that up and the soluble fiber components and the lignans in the flax seeds will create sort of like a gel-like substance that's very similar to eggs. Now, flax seeds are really, really healthy. They've got amazing source, they are an amazing source of omega-3 fatty acids. And they also contain lignans, which are a special phytochemical that is really important for breast cancer prevention. So we're gonna include those as part of our black bean brownies. Next up, we've got the food processor. So we're gonna process all of these ingredients together. We are going to go ahead and put the black beans in there, just like I did. We also wanna go ahead and put in some coconut oil. So I've melted some coconut oil here. This is just three tablespoons of coconut oil. And don't worry, we'll put the recipe for this somewhere, either below the video or send it out to the group. Um, But this is three tablespoons of coconut oil. We're gonna combine that with the beans. We're gonna go ahead and add the cocoa powder. So this is cocoa powder and it's just unsweetened cocoa powder, three quarters of a cup of cocoa powder. And cocoa powder, you might've heard that dark chocolate is really good for heart health. Um, It is, (laughs) and it's because of all of the antioxidants in cocoa powder. And so adding this in is also a boost for your heart health, for sure. Now, let me, I'm going to ask you a question on that, uh, because I recently did a a podcast episode with uh, this woman named Talita from Australia. 
She's also yeah. an Instagram uh, personality. I heard and this episode with her, did, I think, yes. <laughs> and did you hear the co- the part about cacao versus cocoa? So yes, I, I think thought, I did. I thought it was just a difference in pronunciation. You know, <laughs> I'm from Canada, North America, and I was saying, I said, oh, it's here is called cocoa. And she was saying, no, actually, cacao is something else. It's, it's I wasn't, you know, and I'm not entirely, <laughs> I've actually heard it both ways. And so I've heard people refer to cocoa as cacao and vice versa. I think it's at the very least a common confusion. And I'm not sure. Right. I'm not so sure they're two it. different things. But I've heard it say to Coco, you know, like I'm not, but you're right. I think, I think that there is a little distinction there, but regardless, whatever it is, it's full of those good polyphenols. You do want to get like the unsweetened kind, because, you know, there, there will be hot chocolate mixes and things like that, that you can buy that will have sugar added. So this stuff is completely unsweetened. So be sure that when you are buying this kind of, um, this kind of cocoa powder or cacao powder, that it's unsweetened. But that's a good question. <laughs> All right, so now next up, we're gonna do a little bit of sea salt. This is just like a quarter teaspoon of sea salt adding to this. And we're gonna like basically just blend these all together. So a quarter teaspoon of sea salt, a little bit of vanilla extract. So this is gonna be just a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Do, do, do. There we go. And then we do wanna use some sort of sweetener. You can use a sweetener of choice, whatever you prefer. I happen to have coconut sugar on hand. So this is coconut sugar. It's about a half cup and you wanna put that in there as well. If you wanted to use cane sugar, if you wanted to use other things too, you totally can. It's really up to you in terms of the sweetener. You can also probably use something like a non-nutritive sweetener like stevia or something like that. You just wanna make sure it's like a one-to-one -one ratio probably with um, like normal standard cane sugar would be my recommendation. And then also we got some baking powder here. So baking powder will help it rise a little bit. That's a teaspoon and a half of that. So now we've combined almost all of our ingredients. The flax that I mixed up is now very gel-like. So it's kind of got this gel-like texture that's very similar to maybe an egg. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pour that in for our egg substitute. All right. So all of that is in there now. I also tend to add a little bit more water, about two tablespoons of it, depending on the consistency of it. So I'm gonna grab some water from the sink and have that on hand just in case we need it. So now, let's go ahead and pulse it. So now it's gonna to come together and become more of a batter. This is the point at which I'm gonna add a little bit more water. We want the consistency to be like chocolate frosting, but a little bit thinner. Okay, a little bit thinner than chocolate frosting. All right, a little bit more water. Perfect. And there you have it. So let me go ahead and bring this closer to show you. This is our brownie batter mix. Oh, nice. That it's looks good. Pretty, yeah, it's pretty, you know, thin-ish. And so what you want to do at this point is this is going to make about 12 mini muffin tin brownies because these are easy in a muffin tin kind of brownies. So what you'd want to do next, and I'm not going to do this because it's very messy and I baked a batch earlier to show you, <laughs> but you'd want to basically grease a muffin tin, divide this batter into 12, and it's going to fill up maybe a third or a half of the cup. It's not going to fill up the whole cup. And then you can top it with whatever you want. Sometimes people like walnuts, some people like chocolate chips, those sorts of things. So you can top, top it with whatever you want and you bake it in the oven at, at I think about 375, the exact number will be in the recipe. Um, for about 20 minutes to 25 minutes. And that's until they're set. Okay, so that's the brownie piece. As your brownies are cooking, what we wanna be doing next is making the raspberry and pomegranate compote. So I've already made this ahead of time just to save on time, but what you're gonna to add to this compote is gonna be two cups of raspberries, a quarter cup of pomegranate juice, and you can buy pomegranate juice at the store, um, or you can, I have a pomegranate here, you can actually just extract the seeds and pummel them in like a cocktail shaker with like one of those mixers. And then that you can pour out and you can use your own pomegranate juice if you prefer to do that. 
but a quarter cup isn't much and you can get that from a pomegranate easily. And then two tablespoons of maple syrup. And what you do is you combine those on the stove and then you can go ahead and let them simmer down for about 10 minutes until slightly thickened and then remove it from the heat. And then at that point, I like to add in some chia seeds. These are really rich in omega-3 fatty acids and soluble fiber, just a little extra boost. And it also helps to create a more of a jelly, kind of like gel-like texture. So a teaspoon and a half of chia seeds, stir it in after you remove it from the heat and let sit for about five minutes. All right? Okay. So now I'll show you the finished product if you're ready to see it. <laughs> All right. So this is what they'll look like when they come out of the oven. These are the brownies. Mm, nice. And I put chocolate chips on top of them, as you can see. So there's like some chocolate chips on there. Maybe you can see it. And so what I do then is with the, let me move all these things aside, with the raspberry, either a coulis or a compote, we were deciding what we wanted to call it. <laughs> you can take it here. And this is what I've sort of created over the stove. And you can just kind of drizzle it right on top of there. And these fruits, pomegranates and raspberries in particular, are so rich in anthocyanins and polyphenols, really good for anti-inflammatory prevention of all chronic diseases, et cetera. So all of these good ingredients in here, and then you've got them on your black bean brownies and they taste absolutely amazing. I'm not lying to you because I used to have <laughs> black bean brownies and now I do. <laughs> they look amazing. And why, why again, is it libido boosting? Yeah, so there's a couple of things, you know, nuts and seeds tend to have a couple of libido boosting ingredients. So the flax seeds and the chia seeds, for example, um, that would be things like zinc. And they also have things like L-arginine, which is an amino acid that has been known to boost libido and other protein rich foods have this too. So that would be black beans as well. Yep. So L-arginine, a little bit of zinc, and then anything that helps with basically blood flow is going to help with libido boosting and all of the anti-inflammatory compounds including the antioxidants from the black beans and the cocoa and the fruit all of that really does work towards that same goal okay well delicious healthy and libido boosting we can't go wrong with these huh you really can't. i wish so i wish you could just pass them through i know screen, I was like, right? hey, <laughs> But hopefully you guys try these. They're super easy and fun, and they do taste amazing. You'll have to try them to, to verify, but they are super, super good. My husband ate half the batch already, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, they look great, and thank you so much for going into your kitchen. We really appreciate it. It's been a wonderful show, and uh, I wish you a happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day to you as well, and it was fun hanging out with you guys. Thanks. I hope you found this informative. If you like watching quick and simple cooking videos, please be sure to check out Alternative Food Network's YouTube channel, where we have a bunch of easy recipe videos, including some new shorts. Also, if you would like to subscribe to our newsletter, which includes our latest content and also some giveaways and recipes, uh, we send it out once a month and you can subscribe on our website at alternativefoodnetwork.com and you just click the subscribe button. Until next time, thanks for listening. All content provided or opinions expressed in this podcast are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. Please seek advice from your doctor or other qualified healthcare practitioner.